This video is a technique to restore some sensation to the median nerve distribution in a high median nerve injury that's being repaired. This gentleman was 29 years old and had a complete transection of his median nerve at the antecubital fossa. In this situation, we want to get some sensation from the ulnar nerve to the median nerve, but we anticipate recovery of sensation into the median nerve distribution from an excellent reconstruction at the level of the antecubital fossa. So we want to add to the sensation that's coming from the primary repair. The incision that I'm using here is ulnar to the thenar crease, and it allows me access to the carpal tunnel and the median nerve, as well as Guillain's canal and the ulnar nerve. This video is 22 minutes long. It's our short video. And there's an extended video that's longer than that that will let you see some of the more details of the neurolysis of the median nerve. In this 22-minute video, however, I'm emphasizing some of the subtle techniques with respect to carpal tunnel. And one of them is to have your assistants follow you when you're doing the surgery. So where I'm operating, I want my assistants uh, to be. Now I'm opening up Guillain's canal. Whenever you see that little bit of muscle, that's palmaris brevis, and that's going to take you into Guillain's canal. I'll be looking for the palmar cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve. We don't always see it, but in this case, it's very obvious. And it is obvious with this approach as compared to the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve, which is never really visualized in the uh, carpal tunnel release. This gentleman had that fairly common anomalous muscle of an anomalous palmaris brevis that you can see is moving over into Guillain's canal territory. Once you've decompressed the roof of Guillain's canal, the neurovascular bundle is moved medially. And there's that little cutaneous branch coming off the ulnar nerve. Traction on that branch will result in some movement of the skin in the ulnar palmar area. Here you can see that. I think injury to that branch uh, may be the source of um, pain in patients after carpal tunnel incisions where the incision is made directly over that nerve. I'm looking for the distal end of the carpal ligament, and that would be the junction between the hypothenar muscles and the thenar muscles, and I've marked that with an ink dot. I call that the V, so it's the junction between thenar and hypothenar fascia. I want to have a complete decompression of the ulnar nerve through Guillain's canal for several reasons. One is to ensure the appropriate sensory motor topography. And secondly, this gentleman's had trauma, a surgery at his elbow, and now surgery at his hand and distal forearm. So I want to not have any potential compromise of the ulnar nerve because of swelling or scarring in this area. Now, when I determine where to go through the flexor retinaculum, I'd like to be on the ulnar side. I'm palpating the hook of the hamate now. And there's a dot on the hook of the hamate. But I'll come proximally, and I'm taking a sharp knife and slowly going through the roof of the carpal ligament. If I'm too ulnar, then you won't see that nice little opening. And now that I see just a little thin area, I know I'm on the roof of the carpal ligament, but I'm ulnar. As I go distally, if it becomes too thick, I know I'm going down the side of the carpal tunnel and I move a little more radially. But I'm always heading towards that V where the fascia changes direction between the thenar fascia going over towards the thumb and the hypothenar going over to the small finger. As I get to the distal end of the carpal tunnel, I slow down. This is the sl a slow down moment in this surgery. 
the third web space component of the median nerve is very superficial here. It branches off the median nerve and it can be hidden in that distal fat. And I want to get a complete release of the carpal tunnel and no injury on any branch of the median nerve. So I get good exposure. You can see three instruments in there retracting. I'm using my pickups and I'm slowly going through that distal portion of the ligament. Move back and forth between the Stevens tenotomies and the knife. Now I need to go proximally and retract that muscle so that I get the antibrachial fascia released as well as the carpal ligament. And at the proximal end, you can see it's a sharp change between the fascia and the ligament and the fat in the distal forearm. When you see this median nerve, 29-year-old gentleman, but there's already some uh, evidence of carpal tunnel, you can see how hyperemic that portion of the median nerve is and flattened, and this is with the, with the tourniquet up. So he's got some pressure on that median nerve relating to the injury and some swelling more likely than not. Now I'm looking in the region of the hook of the hamate. You can see that proximal ink mark. That's the hook of the hamate. And I'm going to decompress the deep motor branch. There's a fair amount of fascial tissue, tissue here. And again, with the primary injury, the primary surgery, and the secondary surgery, no one's ever going to come back in here again to release the deep motor branch of the ulnar nerve. I'm, I'm going to be putting my cross grafts from the ulnar nerve to the median nerve exactly in this area. And so I'm definitely going to de decompress the deep motor branch. It's not that I can't find the sensory component without decompressing the motor, but I think it's a good idea while you're here, decompress that motor branch. I think we underestimate superimposed nerve compression in some of these extremity traumas where there's injury surgeries or multiple surgeries and secondary compression from that swelling. Another slow down moment. Go very slowly as you're releasing the deep motor branch around the hook of the hamate. There's little vessels on either side of the deep motor branch. You don't want to injure them and then have to be buzzing for hemostasis close to the deep motor branch. We have other videos that will show you in more detail the decompression of the deep motor branch. But you'll see there is the motor branch there. There is the sensory component. So now I have my sensory component. There's a small cutaneous uh, branch that comes up to the hypothenar area. I'm going to go distal to that. And you'll notice that I used two thin vessel loops to stage or pull up the ulnar nerve. In this situation, I'm going to be moving sensation from the normal ulnar nerve to the denervated median nerve. So it doesn't matter where I pull sensation out of the ulnar nerve. It really matters where it goes into on the median nerve. If you are doing the reverse operation where you're trying to get some sensation into the ulnar nerve, then specifically I'll get the sensation into the ulnar nerve that will be to the small finger. But in this situation, you'll see in a moment after I release this anomalous palmaris brevis, You'll see that I'm very specific about where I'm directing sensation into the median nerve, but as long as I have the sensory component of the ulnar nerve, then that sensation is just fine. I don't need specificity from the ulnar nerve except to get sensation, i.e. don't take the motor branch of the ulnar nerve. Now this is the neurolysis that I was speaking about a bit earlier on the median nerve. You can see I'm using these uh, tenotomy scissors. I've had them specially made for me, modifying Stephen's tenotomies to my liking. And Fisher Instrumentation makes these scissors for me. Um, they're uh, sharpened by Fisher as well. So they're sharp on the cutting surface, but very blunt on the outside. That's really important. And I am doing that neurolysis both longitudinally and transversely. Because in this gentleman, that epineurium is really thick. 
That's the deep motor branch. If you pull up on with the Sen retractor, you can see my assistant pulling up with the Sen retractor, and then pull over with your own instrumentation on the median nerve, then the uh, thenar motor branch will show itself. This gentleman had reasonable thumb opposition from the ulnar nerve. So I'm just decompressing the motor branch here to decompress it and neuralize it from the median nerve because the part of the median nerve that I want to re-innervate with sensory is going to be to the thumb and the radial side of the index finger specifically. So I'm going to neuralize away the part of the median nerve that I don't want to waste any sensory fibers in. That would be the recurrent motor branch and the third web space component of the median nerve to the ulnar side of the long finger and the radial side of the ring finger. But you can see how thick that epineurium is. So this is the short video, and if you look on the long video, you'll see that I am struggling a bit with this neurolysis just because the epineurium is so thick. And I work back and forth with the blunt tenotomy scissors and the micro scissors. So and get in, opening up the epineurium so I can see the fascicles. And then once I'm inside the internal epineurium, I'll go back to the tenotomy scissors to spread away the fascicles. So this is the thenar motor branch. And you can see when I'm tugging on that motor branch, I can follow it with my eyes right around as it enters into the thenar muscles. I don't want to put any sensory fibers in that thenar motor branch, obviously. The other neurolysis now is on the ulnar side of the median nerve to separate the third web space component of the median nerve. You have to remove the epineurium in order to see the cleavage plane between the third web space component of the median nerve and the rest of the median nerve. Distally here, because of that thickening in the epineurium, I'm going distally to see where my third web space branches off so that I'll be able to follow that fascicular group with my eyes, I call it neuralizing with my eyes, proximally into the median nerve, and then I'll be able to dunk into or cleave into that space between the fascicles to the third web space and the rest of the median nerve. And once you get the correct plane, it is just like this. It just opens up easily. If you're struggling, you're not in the right spot. So there's the, there's the median nerve separated into the two components that I don't want to re-innervate and the central component on the median nerve that will innervate the uh, thumb and index finger. So the thenar motor above and the third web space sensory below. And the critical part, especially the first web space part of the median nerve and the second web space between. Now I'll use vessel loops again to stage the median nerve, pull the recipient co component of the median nerve up, just as I've done on the ulnar. There's my oxygen nerve allograft. This is 50 millimeters in length, 2 to 3 millimeters in diameter. I'm going to use that 50 millimeter length allograft, cut it in half, so I have two cables, two and a half centimeters in length, and that's adequate. I'll probably shorten that a couple of millimeters, so I have no tension, but as short a distance possible. So I have my two vessel loops on the ulnar nerve and the median nerve, and that allows me to stage or pull up the recipient and the donors. I'm going to put one allograft on the top of that nerve and one on the bottom so that I'm, in theory, pushing sensory fibers up from above and below into the uh, median nerve and have them looking predominantly at the radial side of that portion of the median nerve. I want to open up the epineurium and the perineurium. I take a marking pen and I just dab the portion of the median nerve and then take my micro pickups and micro scissors and then cut the epineurium on that ink. And you get this lovely little window with the ink marking the outside of the uh, perineurium or very nearby epineurium. And that allows me to 
make the face of that nerve allograft exactly where I want. This nice little window tre- technique was introduced to me by my associate, John Felder. And since we've been using that, others have expressed to us that they've seen this window technique before. So it's not anything new, but it certainly is handy. And I love it because I can then put the nino micro suture picking up on the uh, median nerve. And also when I do it on the ulnar nerve, same technique, so that I can see the point on the recipient and donor nerves to sew my allografts. I can certainly see where I want to sew from the allografts, but on the recipient and the donor, I like to make that ink window. You can see the tourniquet is still up, so we're doing the whole this whole case under uh, tourniquet. Nino micro suture and probably six sutures to put this in place. And then I'll use some to seal to hold it in place. You'll note that we're not doing a tendon transfer for thumb opposition in this particular case because this gentleman had fairly good opposition driven by his ulnar nerve. And there's some to seal. And I hold the um, nerve allograft on fast, i.e. looking at the median nerve while I nail it in place, if you will, with the to seal. So there's the ink. And now micro pickups, pick up in the middle of the ink spot, cut just a little bit, spread, and then you get the nice window with the ink marks around it so that you know exactly where to put your sutures on that recipient median nerve. I've used this technique for a couple of years now, and predominantly it's been for patients with bad ulnar nerve because that's a fairly large patient component that I see with very failed carp- or cubital tunnel surgeries uh, where you're trying to get some sensation into the ulnar nerve distribution. And in that case, as I said before, I'm very strict as to where I go into the ulnar nerve so that I'm putting the allografts looking right at what I think is the ulnar digital nerve to the small finger and the radial digital nerve to the small finger. I will do the recipient uh, suturing before the donor suturing so I can get my specific topography as to where I want these sensory fibers to go. The idea with this cross-cross graft is that it is a second or third degree type of injury. I'm expecting some sensation to come back into the median nerve from the proximal reconstruction. If I thought there was never going to be anything coming back from the proximal reconstruction, then I would do an end-to-end sensory transfer, not this cross-graft, side-to-side, end-to-side transfer. The other thing, and you can see here I'm shortening it a bit, the other thing is that I'm also thinking that I am bringing some sensory fibers into the territory of the median nerve from the ulnar nerve, that will make it a more hospitable environment for the sensory axons once they reach target. There is the ulnar sensory, and that ulnar sensory is going to be giving sensation to the ulnar nerve, ulnar side, radial side of the small finger, ulnar side of the long finger. So if we were trying to move something from the sensory to the ulnar, I'd be staging that reconstruction so that I would be having the nerve allograft look directly at the digital nerves that would be going to the small finger rather than the ring finger. In my hands, I'm comfortable with nerve allografts for less than three centimeters. So this five centimeter piece of allograft cut in two gives me two cables. And at this location in the extremity, the distance between the ulnar nerve and the median nerve, even in large hands, is um, less than two and a half centimeters in pretty much every patient I've done. 
when the reconstruction is done at this level in Guion's Canal and at the level of the carpal tunnel. So you can see here I'm shortening that two and a half centimeter cable. In some situations where you actually have autographed, then I would use autographed rather than allographed. But typically in these situations of the cross-cross graphs, that isn't the case. You'd have to be going somewhere to a new donor uh, site. When I put the bring the to seal in, I'll hold the ends of that allograph so they're looking 90 degrees at the uh, donor ulnar nerve. There's no tension on any repair graft. And so just a little bit of maybe a week of uh, wrist immobilization is enough. And you can see distally that cutaneous nerve coming off of the ulnar nerve up to the skin is still nicely intact. And of course, in this patient, that ulnar nerve is normal. Now I'm holding it up so that it's going 90 degrees to the ulnar nerve. Hold it up and then hold it in place with, with to seal. The tourniquet will come down. Good hemostasis will be obtained. The incision will be closed after some marcaine is placed in it. <laughs> 